Two of the central affirmations, perhaps the most basic affirmation of our faith, is that this book, the Bible, contains the Word of God. I stress this over and over and over, and that is the reason why I have, I have from the day I was ordained, and interestingly enough, a Presbyterian minister is officially designated as a teaching elder. For that reason, I have taught, taught, taught Bible, because I am firmly convinced that the great amount of confusion in our midst all the incredible nonsense that is fired at us from tubes through all kinds of media and all kinds of charlatans of which the Reverend Moon is not the least. That all this confusion can flower only because we are not really sure what we believe and why. And we have become so tolerant that anything goes. The great danger is that we read this book like we read any other book. I shudder when people tell me, do you know I'm now on my twelfth reading of the Bible, and I said 12th reading of the Bible, yes, from beginning to end, every chapter, the 12th time, now quite apart from the misplaced pride, one of my great teachers at seminary was Dr. Niebuhr, and he pointed out that pride is really sin. I'll come back to this in the sermon. Pride is sin because pride is I. I am smarter than you, that's intellectual pride. My religion is better than yours, that's religious pride. My race is superior to yours, that's racial pride. You take it, the whole realm. I got more money than you, and so forth. Pride, if you analyze it, is basically sin. And the pride in reading so many times the Bible is religious sin. But now quite apart from that practice, how can you read meaningfully something that has so many layers and which there are hidden treasures which you will stumble upon like in that parable of which we spoke? A man who plowing a field stumbled upon a treasure. Unless you keep plowing, see, even though he just finds, he doesn't find by doing nothing about it. Plowing is a tough job, certainly in that time, by hand, with an animal or even a man pulling that thing through heavy ground in that in terrible climate. And then he strikes. It's the same with the study of the Bible. It takes effort. And then we stumble upon treasures. The greatest danger of this book is that we read across it, skim over it, and never really listen. And of course, that other danger, our familiarity. Who cannot recite the 23rd Psalm? Has it ever occurred to you? why he makes us to lie down in green pastures before he leads us to the water. Because a good shepherd, you see, had to have the sheep rest before they drink. Otherwise they died from a bloating of the stomachs. The implication, you see, on a deeper level, that this God is a wise shepherd who knows what he's doing. He's not in a hurry to get home. And if you look at that psalm in its structure, then you see how the lines get wider and wider and longer and longer. And thus outwardly, 
In Hebrew, you see it formed a sound structure with a broad base. These things come only gradually. It has amazed me this last year of my last preaching how over and over again studying texts on which I had preached before that God gave me to see new layers of truth. There is such depth and of course the most damning thing is our familiarity with it. We know it. How many generations prayed our Father who art in heaven and would not sit next to a black in church obviously praying my white Anglo-Saxon father. Our father means the father of all of us. So, I want to read to you once more now, with care, the first few verses of that Deuteronomy text in the 31st chapter. And Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land. And the land said, and the Lord said to him, this is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes but you shall not go over there. Do we sense the tragedy of what we read here? Do we realize the hardships that lay behind them those 40 years? From the time he received this call and God said to him, now you go and talk to Pharaoh. And he said, me? No. Ask my brother, take my brother. He talks better than I do. And God said, no, you. What am I going to tell him? You tell him what I tell you. How are they going to believe me? Give me a sign. God gave him a sign and then he goes. And then comes this whole period of difficult negotiations and then finally that fabulous story of the crossing of the Red Sea. And then they start complaining. Of course. Wished you had left us back there. We wouldn't have all this trouble. That generation had to die, see? And in those 40 years, all those critics and all those who remembered the flesh pots of Egypt died. And there grew up a tough young generation of Israelis with the vision of their own nation and the willingness to fight and sacrifice for it as in the early days of this nation not ruined yet by affluence and softened by all the blessings of our modern society. And now he has finally reached the goal after all these battles. And now God lets him see it, but he is not to enter it. Forty years and finally in sight, and now he cannot go. Tragedy only in human terms. You see, great men toil at the task, but the full bloom they rarely, if ever, know. Read that 90th Psalm where we are compared to grass which grows up and withers and is cut down. And the beauty of our lives, but as a flower soon fading and dying. It's no use fooling ourselves about this. The span of our years, whether it be three score and ten or four score years, the psalmist tell us is but toil and trouble. But then comes this magnificent ending. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us. And establish thou the work of our hands. You see, that's why I have it always looked upon my ministry as 
the role of the sower. All I could do to the best of my ability, so what happens to the seeds is not my problem. It's in his hand. Our lives are given to a larger goal than the quick results and the shabby gains which most want to see so quickly. That is the significance of unfinished cathedrals. They've always bothered me until I realized that there is some majesty in an unfinished cathedral. Generations built, men of great vision and faith started foundations so enormous that they could not possibly expect ever to finish it. In relatively small towns like Charter or Cologne at the time, little more than a village. But the vision lived and the goal persisted and generations added until gradually, you see, that is good biblical theology. The same majesty of surrender we find at the end of the life of David in that other passage. Once more he too rises to the full stature of a man of God when he speaks on his deathbed to his son, I am about to go the way of all the earth. Just that. No panic, no pathos. Calmly accept God's order of creation and no fear knowing himself in God's hand as he wrote so beautiful in one of his Psalms even in the shadow of the valley of death last Sunday I stood at the grave of Zachary Taylor which is near the church I started in Louisville, 12th president of these United States. On his gravestone is written, I endeavored to do my duty. I am ready to die. There's that same majesty and that same awareness of that limitation, leaving it to God. No man knows the place of his burial to this day, we read next. That's magnificent, you know. You realize of whom we are speaking here? One of the greatest figures of humanity? A man of such stature as are only few to be counted in the course of all history. Of course, we tend to place a Moses next to the other religious figures of the Old Testament, an Abraham, and later on, an Isaiah, a Jeremiah, a David, if you wish. But it's far more than that. Seen in terms of secular history, the history of the world, one of the great giants who is the founder of this nation single-handedly raises this bunch of slaves constantly protesting to a role that is to culminate in a great kingdom which at one time dominated the whole Middle East. There is a figure who is also the great lawgiver, the Ten Commandments, and yet no man knows the place of his burial to this day. Compare this to the monuments to mortals we built. Travel across Europe, places like Vienna, for instance, and Paris, where in every square there is a monument, often on a horse of some duke, some prince, some marshal, some one who made some contribution to history, it is true. No monument to Moses. 
no monument to any of the figures in the Bible. No man knows the place of his burial to this day. No tombstone, but if there were one, it would have the inscription, Servant of God. And that, of course, is the reason why they have no monument. He was nothing. None of these men was anything. That is why with all the great prophets in the Old Testament, we rarely, if ever, know where they were born, who their parents were, where they came from. They appear suddenly, and there is Jeremiah, and there is Isaiah, and he speaks the word of God sometimes with great personal courage and at personal risk. But the person is unimportant. It's the message. It is only in as far as they are spokesmen of God is what they say of significance. The person is nothing. It was, in the words of Jeremiah, let him who boasts, boast of the Lord. Paul uses this quote repeatedly, interestingly enough, in his letters. He had a tendency to boast, as I guess we all have, and that includes me. You have this, this well, this devil is always prowling around like a roaring lion, it says somewhere, and we're all tempted. Boasting is pride again, and pride is sin. Let him who boasts, boast of the Lord. This was a reality for both Moses and David. In our catechism, of course, we know that line, what is the chief and highest end of man? And the answer, man's chief and highest end is to glorify God. There it is again, you see, except that we don't live that way. Now, one more thing about Moses' death. And the people of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab, 30 days. Then the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. There's that same majesty again. There's a time to mourn, I guess. There's a time to be born, there's a time to die, there's a time to harvest, there's a time to sow, and so forth. There's a time to mourn. They wept in the plains of Boab for 30 days, but then the days of weeping and mourning were ended. There's a lesson for us here, and there's a lesson for you here. Now, whatever tears are going to be shed, and please, not 30 days. <laughs> this dreadful tendency we have to prolong what is in the final analysis, our self-centered grief. Think of that sometime. Then God said to Joshua, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land which I am giving to them. Note now the two elements. First, arise and go. I have stressed this over the years time and again. I say it again. I believe with the, from the bottom of my heart that it is very sound theology to say God helps those who help themselves. Or in that other phrase, praise the Lord, and pass the ammunition. Or as we have said it on, at times, we must pray as hard as if all depended upon God, but we must work as hard as if all depended upon us. It's these two aspects. Notice the words to Joshua now, who must move on, arise and go, servant is dead, you go over this Jordan, and you now complete the job. And then the other aspect. And I, into the land which I am giving to them. We have a Pledge of Allegiance. We will probably say it again this coming 
national holiday. We say it on all kinds of occasions. This nation under God. But do we really believe it? We put on our coins in God. We trust we have the same statement in the seal of this republic. But do we really believe this? That the Lord is my shepherd. Or is it my bank account, my tenure, my securities, my whatever? Is it really in God we trust, ultimately and finally? Or in something else? That he is my refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. If you look again at those hymns we sang and will sing and which you heard in America, is in all of them is this same rock-like assurance that it is built and built securely only if it is built in God. And that he is in charge. This irrevocably is central in biblical faith. There's no escape, there is no alternative. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. In those commandments, as if to remind Moses now, you did a fine job, fellow. But remember now, you alone, nothing. If it hadn't for, been for me, God, if I had not performed that miracle at that Red Sea, and if you have trouble with miracles, and if you wish to remove them, then you unravel the whole tapestry of this book. Because the miraculous element, where God acts beyond all human understanding, is equally central because God cannot be understood. The Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, if you cannot accept this, then this book makes no sense whatsoever. And what we preach, of course, makes no sense. God said to Joshua, be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. Note now, God's promise of success has a condition. Being careful to do according to all the law. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left. Stay, in the terms of the New Testament, on the straight and narrow. The world is wide and leads this, that leads to destruction. The load is hard and narrow that leads to salvation. It is that road. David, in that other passage, passing the baton to Solomon, also says, be strong and keep the charge of your God, walking in his ways and keeping his commandments. There they are again. The strong and the keeping his commandments, that source of strength that is rooted in that faith and obedience. Paul, who writes, stand firm in your faith, be courageous, be strong. The same idea again, you see, the two are interlinked and cannot be separated. To be strong, to act decisively when and where needed must stem from a conviction, from a faith. It is not coincidental places to stand firm in your face next to be courageous and be strong as in David's last will. We hear a great deal these days about the crisis of authority as regards to parents and their children, educators and concerning enforcing discipline, our courts in questions ranging from capital punishment to pornography 
On every level of our society, there seems to be this large amount of doubt. Well, I'm not sure, and we do not quite know how to cope with this, and there is either or, and it's all this talk about it's one big area of gray. No, there isn't. Either you are honest or you aren't. As someone once illustrated to me, you cannot be a little bit pregnant. Either you are or you aren't faithful to these commandments. Either you, will, you try honestly to walk the way God through his son taught us in the Sermon on the Mount, or you don't. You manipulate. You said, well, now a little, but not, uh, let's not overdo it. And it didn't really seriously mean not, not that strict. That's Victorian. That's outlandish. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And then read the interpretation of our Lord. We talked about that recently. It is a very narrow road. And it is on walking that narrow road on which rests the condition for being success successful. It is my deepest conviction that these parting words contain the most basic law of this universe, that God was not only creator of it all, of all we are and all we have, but that he also placed us on this earth with a purpose and gave us the guidelines, the manual, so to speak, how to use it. And that if we ignore that manual, in the words of Moses and Joshua, his commandments, his statutes, and so forth. If we ignore them, the end result is chaos. From beginning to end of this book, that point is belabored. From the moment Eve and then Adam think they can do in spite of God's command as they please, the thing is shut. The prodigal who thinks that he can take his share and live his way and do as he pleases ends up sharing the food of swine. Lower a Jew could not fall. That is the end of that rope. It is not just be strong and very courageous. It is be faithful to his commandments, do not waver to the right or left from his law. It is a question of courage and obedience. But if we have both the courage and the obedience, then, as he said to his servants, be not frightened, neither be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I want to close with that passage which I wrote also in the bulletin and you can look it up from the first letter of Peter. Cast all your anxieties on him for he cares about you. Be sober, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same experience of suffering is required of your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, establish, and strengthen you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen.